Um, as you came in, you may have noticed that uh, one of the new projectors is up, and you can see, see pretty clearly why it was something that we wanted to address. Um, one of the things that came up, well, can you just change the bulb? Uh, the answer is yes, but these projectors would never go back to that. Um, you have your technology. Um, some people like it, some don't. Technology, the, one of the biggest problems is it gets old fast. And um, as technology gets old, uh, you can refurbish it, but you can't make it new. And that's what we were running into. And as we use projectors more and more to help with, uh, in my case, with teaching or with uh, songs during the service and things like that. If you can't read it clearly, what's the point? And so um, we walked in, well, that's pretty vivid. And uh, appreciate Peter uh, taking his time to help get all that stuff up. Uh, obviously, this one's in place, but it's not a 30-minute job. So hopefully by next Sunday, that one will be up as well. Let's pray, and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for the day and for your goodness to us. I ask God that you would guide and direct in all that we do. Help the time that we spend here to be beneficial and profitable. Father, help us to learn uh, life principles that we can take and use and apply within our lives that we might live in a way that pleases you. And we ask this in your name. Amen. All right. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go to 1 Peter. As you can see from the title slide, we're going to talk about Peter and Peter describing holiness. Uh, I will ask your forgiveness already. We've been talking about the Apostle Paul for how many weeks? There's a pretty decent chance at some point I will say Paul instead of Peter today. Um, we've been talking about Paul for the better part of, uh, what, uh, 10 weeks or so, or maybe more than that. Um, and the statement underneath the title there, believers are to be holy because God is holy. He is the example that we're to follow. Things that we've heard, seen, um, not a whole lot new in here, but hopefully uh, information that will be helpful and beneficial to us as we get started. Our question as we get started here is, what is our standard of holiness? Uh, it's easy to say, be ye holy, for I am holy. Okay, what does holy mean? How do we measure that? Um, at work and maybe at your work, we have certain metrics or measures that we are supposed to meet. Um, how do you measure those? If they're not measurable, what's the point? And so that's what we're talking about here. Um, what is our standard or what is the measure of holiness? Our verse, as we, uh, as we get started here, the same verse that we had last week, uh, for our conversation um, is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Um, probably for next week, I'm going to, not necessarily divide it up, but uh, add some color to this to kind of show the different thoughts and, thoughts and ideas that are within it. Um, there's so much information within the lesson that we very seldom spend much time on this, this verse. Um, point out a couple minutes here or there, but uh, there's a lot packed into these two verses, talking about where we are now with our conversation, but it's, uh, it's in heaven where we're saved eternally and talking about the fact that our temporal body is going to be remade, which is kind of a pleasant thought, isn't it? And so uh, we'll look at that a little bit more in the coming, in the coming weeks. 1 Peter chapter 1 is where we'll get started this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, looking at just a couple of verses as we get started, uh, verses 13 through 16. Now, before we dive into the passage here, uh, we've mentioned already this is the last unit in this study. And one of the things that I thought was interesting, and when I pointed it out to Pastor, he did as well, um, we, we've spent quite a bit of time in different places within the Scripture or in, with different people. Uh, obviously, with creation, as we laid a foundation, set the background for the study, we spent uh, a lot of time. And then as we've moved on, um, like with Paul and his writings, and Paul will still show up within this unit a couple of times. Uh, like I said, we spent a uh, unit, unit and a half. Um, we're going to get to the last book of, this, of the Bible, and we're going to have like one lesson. Because the focus of this study is on the apologetic side, not the prophecy side. And when I was talking to the pastor, like, it actually works because he just recently preached through Revelation and taught through that. So 
Uh, it actually works out well for what we're doing, but I thought it was kind of interesting. But what we're doing here, and I've, if you think way back uh, years ago, as we started this, talk about the, this is a, an overview. It's kind of a flyby. Uh, we're going to point out different reference points, and when you see something or find something that's intriguing, you can drive over there and walk around and take your own personal tour and study it on your own. And that's kind of what we're going to do here within this last unit. And like I said, Revelation is like, hey, that might be something we want to go study as we go flying by. Chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. Um, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is uh, to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Uh, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So Peter's writing here, he's writing to these believers. Um, go back, if you will, just to the, to the first, first verse, or, uh, first verse and a couple of words in verse, verse 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, makes it very clear who the writer is. Uh, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. He's writing to believers, but he's not necessarily writing, writing to the Jews. Okay? He's writing to believers. Keep that in mind. So then we come to these verses that we're looking at today, and he's basically giving them, hey, here's information that you need that you can live rightly before God. And he, as he describes it here, that you can live holy. So as he's writing to them, he gives them three commands. Uh, he's got three statements here. Look back uh, to verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Hope to the end for the grace. So hope in grace. And the three ideas here uh, pretty much are fairly easy to understand, except for that first one. Not something that we talk about a whole lot today. Um, at work, there are days that I know that uh, the area that I work in, we're going to get a lot of boxes in a hurry. Always exciting. Um, there are days I've got, uh, what do I have? Uh, 13, 14 doors in, that uh, we cover in my area. Um, there are days that uh, we'll fire up the equipment and I'll have in the neighborhood of 1,800 to 2,000 boxes an hour coming down. Uh, we've got to figure out how to get them where they belong in a hurry. There are times I'll use this statement, I'll tell my guys, hey, buckle up, it's going to get fun in a hurry. Buckle up is the same idea that Paul's talking about right here. That same idea, gird up the loins of your mind, that gird up the loins. We don't deal with it today. It's a whole different way of living. They didn't have pants or trousers back then. What did they have? They had long robes. When it was time for busy or hard activity, what did they do? They turned their robes into trousers, into pants. They took their robe and put it under their belt. They girded it up. That's what he's talking about. He says, hey, this is going to be a challenge. Buckle up and get ready. That's what he's talking about here. Be sober. Be awake, aware, and alert. Know what's going on. And then hope in grace, which is kind of interesting there because the only way that we can live the Christian life in this present world is through the grace of God. He empowers us. He gives us the ability to do that. And so um, Peter's uh, laying the stage for what he's going to talk about here. And when we're reading in Scripture, and again, we've talked about this, but it's been, a, been quite a while one of the things we, we want to do, that we need to do, is to think about what's being said and what's being said in its historical context. That idea of gird up your loin, the loins of your mind. We don't think of that. We don't use that statement, that term, that phrase, because that's not the world that we live in. But they knew exactly what he was saying. Um, let me look here. Uh, he talks about this grace, and this grace that is uh, given, brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So how do we get this? When we, when we know Christ, then that grace is made available to us. Uh, verse 14, as obedient children, 
he's writing to them and he says that we're to obey God as a child would obey the father. Uh, that idea of obedience. And it's a, a bit more challenging in that I can see dad, but I can't see the father. I have to trust him by faith. And keep in mind, these folks back here that Peter was writing to, they did not have a Bible that they could get off the shelf and go to. They had to go by what they had learned and what the Spirit told them was right and wrong. They had to be completely in tune with God. We have the Bible. And you know what? We need to be completely in tune with God. How often is it that we can look in the Scripture to see what he said and not see what he said? We can read it, and it goes into our eyes uh, a little bit and psh, right back out of our mind. So as he's writing here, we're to be obedient. We're to be obedient as a, as a child is obedient to the Father. He talks here. Um, in this same verse, verse 14, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Uh, we're not to model ourselves after the world according to our former lusts. We've been changed. Uh, Paul wrote, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Don't be like the old. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. That's how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live like all things have become new not after those former lusts. And the idea of former here means prior to receiving Christ. When we come to Christ, there's to be a change. And that change then impacts each and every area of life. And that's what Peter's getting to as we work through this. So he's talking to their former lusts. That idea, before they knew Christ, they fashioned themselves, and, and I, like, I like the way he words this here, according to the former lusts, in your ignorance... What is he saying here? You didn't know any better back then, but now you do. Well, how do I know better? Because the Spirit of God dwells within. He lets me know what's right and wrong. So be obedient, because in Christ we should know better. We should know how to, how to do things. Because all things have changed. They've become new. Look at verse 15. As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Uh, that idea that each and every aspect of my life, it's not like, well, this is my Christian part of life, and this is, back when I, oh heavens, it'd be a long time ago. Back when I was a young person, uh, when I was teaching back in Texas years and years and years ago, um, I was talking to somebody, uh, a young lady in one of my classes, and she made the comment, Saturday's my day to do what I want. And I'm like, that just doesn't work. Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Sunday, Saturday, everything in between here is God's day to do what he wants. And, and we can so jealously, jealously hold on to what I want, to do what I want. And... and we live in a world that absolutely promotes that. Whatever makes you feel good, have at it. Or whatever you want, you deserve. Uh, think back, uh, and this would be years ago now, but you're, many of you will remember this, uh, commercial that used to run for a fast food joint, you deserve a break today. And some of you know exactly what restaurant it is as you grab for your Big Mac. Right? You deserve. In fact, Pastor talked about it, was it last Sunday? With his grandson, I, I, I deserve dessert. Uh, it's ingrained in us from a young age. We deserve. And God says, in all manner of your conversation, every area of life, you're to be holy as I am holy. It talks here in verse 15, but as he which has made you, well, who is the he? Who is the maker, the creator? He's referring to God the Father. And so we are to model the Father, not the world. We're to live after the example of God, not all this stuff that I see around me. Uh, we could, for time I won't, because uh, that clock just will not stop. Uh, but we could go over to 1 John chapter 2. Love not the 
world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, what's the rest of that statement? The love of the Father is not in him. Where is my passion? As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. So the believers called to pursue holiness. That's what we're trying to do. Not because doing gains me any points with God. And we talked about this, this was the last week or the week before. It's not about doing, it's about being. It's not that I'm doing holiness, it's that I am holy. That I am following the example of Jesus Christ. That I am doing what he wants me to do. As God has called us and saved us, we should be holy. Because of what he has done, there should be, well, to every action there's an equal and opposite he saved me, what's the reaction? He saved me, the reaction should be that I want to draw close to him and be like him. And so that's what he's called us to. Because he is holy, we should be holy. If you want to make a note, I don't, again, for time, I'm not, I'm not going to go here, but Leviticus 11, uh, 44 and 45, talks about this, a statement given to the, uh, to the Jews, to the Hebrews, way back in the Old Testament, during their wandering period. And God told them, hey, here's the example that you need to follow. And when you do that, if you go over there and look at that, you'll find cross-references. You'll find cross-references here in 1 Peter. Uh, again, this is a flyby. When you see something that you find intriguing or interesting, dive in and take a tour and do a study. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And then that statement, all manner of conversation, all parts of life. Um, and that can be a challenge. It can be a challenge to yield to him each and every aspect of my life. No matter where you are and what you're doing, be ye holy. Now we're looking at Peter, 1 Peter. But we're going to move over to Matthew now, because this is the topic that we have here. So dive over, uh, turn over to Matthew 22, Matthew 22. And we'll look at uh, just a couple of verses here. Matthew 22 and verse 34. And Matthew's writing here, and he's talking about the first and the great commandment. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Now, that would have been an interesting uh, discussion to be privy to. Because the Pharisees did not think much of the Sadducees. So they were probably like, hey, this is fantastic, but we better be careful because <laughs> he obviously knew how to deal with them. They were concerned about Christ, but at the same time, they were glad. So then they have a question. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, at this point my dad would, uh, would really find great glee because uh, he says, you know, the Old West, whenever the good guy rode out of town, the last thing he did in the way it was shoot the lawyer. Um, but the lawyer, what does he say? The, the one who was well steeped in the law. Remember when Jesus was a child and went to the temple? He was talking with the doctors and lawyers. They knew Moses and knew it well. And so the lawyer asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, what is the great commandment? That sounds to me like a loaded question. It's a fair question, but they knew what answer they wanted. And Jesus said unto them, gave them exactly what they wanted to hear. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And he doesn't stop there. They asked for the first, he gives them the first and the second, which isn't exactly what they wanted. This is the first great commandment, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. He says everything else is hinged on these. You do these, the rest of them fall right into place.
And I'm not sure that's what they were looking for. Again, commandment number one, they were well acquainted with that, but I don't think they really were expecting commandment number two in this discussion. So the first and great commandment, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Basically, love him completely or entirely. Love him with your entire being. Everything is to be with him in focus, him in mind. The second commandment, love your neighbor. Notice it doesn't stop there. As Jesus is speaking, he doesn't say, love God and love others. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that's a whole different discussion when it comes to, to, to love. And so there's two commands here. The commands are to love God and love others, but the, it's the way he phrases them, the way he talks about them. Because there's no command here to love yourself, it's to love others as you love yourself. Now we, again, we talk about the world that we live in. The world that we live in is real big on loving yourself, on self-care, on self-esteem. Hey, make sure that your needs are taken care of as you watch the rest of the world die. And, and Matthew is recording the words of Christ. He says, love God completely. Love others as you love yourself. Just like you see that your needs are taken care of, look around and see who you can be a help and a blessing to. And so that kind of sets the stage then for what does it mean to live holy? Well, I need to live with him in focus and with them in mind. All right, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll begin in verse 10. Ephesians 6, 10, passage is uh, fairly familiar to us. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Because of this, then take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Okay, we've seen that idea already from Peter and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod at the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel." for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We'll get to it again, but I find that interesting. Here you have Paul, who seldom passed on an opportunity to speak up, asking them to pray that he would have boldness. Doesn't seem to be a problem, but apparently he knew that this boldness came from God. And he needed God to help him. So back to the beginning of the passage here, verse 10. Um, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. We are to look to God for strength and to rely upon his might. How is it that we are able to do what he has called us to? Think back to Peter. Be holy as I am holy. How can we do that? Not through our own strength. That can only be accomplished through the strength that comes from God. We have to rely upon him. And as he writes here, he uses an analogy that each and every one of them would understand, that of the Roman armor. And again, we've seen pictures, and I was going to put this uh, slide in here, but we've done that before. Again, it's been a long time ago. Um, but you've seen pictures of the Roman armor. It's not like the Middle Ages, where they had their, had their big armor that you see standing up in the museums now. Uh, you didn't get in to the Roman armor, you put it on. And he's talking about something that they very clearly understood. Um, that armor. In talking about that, he makes sure that they understand our enemy is the devil. 
not our neighbor. And I don't mean your physical neighbor. Our enemy is the devil that we can't see, not somebody that we can see walking around. This fight is a spiritual fight. It's spiritual warfare. And the armor that God has given us allows us to stand against the wiles, the cunning of the devil. The armor that God has given us isn't a helmet and a shield and a sword and a breastplate. That's the analogy that he's using. The armor that he's given us is faith and truth, the gospel, salvation, the sword of the spirit. The armor that he's given us isn't the physical picture, it's what the picture represents. And again, the battle is spiritual. We know that, we hear that. I mentioned it just a moment ago, had another note. It's spiritual. Um, think back, Elisha goes into the city and the king sets up his army around him in the city and the servant is all worried and afraid and say, oh no, look at all this. And Elisha says, oh, but those that are with us are more than with them. God opened his eyes that he might see. And God opens the servant's eyes and he looks out there and he sees the host of the Lord encamped around the enemy. It's a spiritual battle. We can't see it. Because we can't see it, we don't think about it often, and we don't fight it often. Not that we don't, aren't engaged in the fight, that's not what I mean. But we don't, we, this is the generic we, okay? But we don't take it as real. We live our life one day at a time, paycheck to paycheck, God help me to have enough money at the end of the month, and we don't realize, hey, there are far more significant things at stake here. The battle is real, and it's a spiritual battle. Within this discussion here, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And notice what it says here in verse 12. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil has his minions to do his bidding. And we've, we, we've heard this, we've talked about this, Pastor may have mentioned it recently. The devil is not omnipresent. Where he is, he is. Where God is, he's there and everywhere else too. There's a huge difference there. And a lot of the time that we are fighting the devil, no, some, a lot of times we're fighting our own temptations. And we need to understand the battle. We need to be aware of the enemy. Uh, oh, the devil's walking around as a roaring lion. Sometimes he's not roaring too loudly, though, and we walk right up and don't realize he's behind the bush. Okay, we need to be aware of the devil, that this enemy is out there. We can't see the foe, but the foe is present. Elisha's servant can't see all those angels encamped out there, but they were there before God opened his eyes. Elisha knew they were there, but the servant didn't. A lot of times we can't see the enemy. They're still there. And God's angels are still there too. Through all of this, this great battle that's taking place for the hearts and minds of men, through all of this, we need to stand. And we need to stand, and we need to still stand. Look at the end of verse 13. Okay, you may be able to withstand, and having done all to stand, verse 14, stand therefore. You think he's trying to make a point? You can't, we can't fight the battle laying down. We need to stand. We need to be engaged and involved. And God has equipped us that we might stand. Think of, uh, oh my, um, football season is just about done. Okay, let's think of football players. Depending upon where they're playing and what kind of surface they're playing on, how many different pair of cleats or football shoes do they have? They've got sh shoes for playing on natural, natural grass. They've got different shoes for playing on what, uh, the old astral turf or now it's athletic turf. Um, sometimes they've got multiple types with varying depths of the cleats. They've got all these different types of shoes 
but they're playing the same game regardless of where they're playing. They have different shoes to help them to do what they're supposed to do under any given circumstances. God has given us, he's equipped us that we can stand. He knows what we're dealing with. He knows what we're faced with. When we go to him and pray and ask him for his strength that we might do what he's called us to do, that we might stand, he gives us exactly what we need. He equips us. We must stand. He's equipped us. And the elements of this armor are paralleled within qualities or necessities of the Christian life. And that's what we'll look at here for these next few minutes. Um, the belt. He talks about um, uh, having your loins girt about with truth. That idea, again, we talked about that. The uh, going to take our robe and turn them into trousers. Well, how do we do that? We're girt about with truth. We have this belt on. And this belt is for, is, uh, serves a purpose. It's not ornamental. Uh, the Roman army, they didn't carry too much that was ornamental. They were involved in one job, and it was not fighting wars. Their job was winning wars. And they were, in, they were outfitted for one purpose, and it wasn't to fight. It was to win. And so they only had with them what they needed. And the belt was important because the belt allowed them, it allowed them protection in their lower organs, but it also allowed them to take their robes and turn them into pants so that it's easier to run and fight without having something that's going to grab onto the hem of your garment and things like that, okay? It's important. And so they have this, this truth here, truth for us today. What does it tell us in John 17, 17? Thy word is truth. We have truth available to us. We live in a world that is really confused. Read headlines. Watch the news. I would strongly recommend not. <laughs> um, Why well, live life full of discouragement? Um, but seriously, we live in a world that's confused. Things that Again, I, I talked to my dad for about 15, 20 minutes on the way to work every night. Uh, and more than once, he made, who would have thought that we would see, and you can fill in the blank, uh, things that we would have never dreamed of happening. We see them all around us. How do we know what's right? How do we know what's wrong? Thy word is truth. I have to read it. I have to take it by faith and know that what God has says, what God has said is true, that it's right. Thy word is truth. It talks about the breastplate and the breastplate of righteousness. Now, that's a challenge. But it fits because be ye holy as I am holy. And just like Peter said, you can't do that on your own. You can only do that through the grace that is given to you by God. So this righteousness is not our righteousness. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. This righteousness is the righteousness of Christ that is imputed to us. His righteousness is made our righteousness. That is an entire series of lessons by itself. That is absolutely fantastic. Bible doctrine, that we have the righteousness of Christ made ours. He talks about shoes. We mentioned shoes a moment ago. The shoes that help us to stand and to stand from the preparation of the gospel of peace. And it's that gospel that brings peace with God. The spiritual warfare, before you come to Christ, guess what? You're at war with him. He's standing here saying, I love the world so much I sent my son. And you're saying, I don't want that son. And then you realize who that son is and what he did, and you come to him, and all of a sudden now you're on his side, and he is there not with arms. He's enveloping you. How do we get that peace with God? It comes only through the gospel of Jesus Christ, to know that he came and he lived, he died, he was raised again, and through this we can have the forgiveness of sins. We have that shield, that shield of faith. And it's by faith that we can overcome temptation. Faith what? There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. 
He will help us to overcome that temptation. We have faith. We have the helmet, that helmet of salvation. And we learn of salvation through the Bible. Now, keep in mind, he's writing this to whom? If we go back to Ephesians chapter 1, in the very beginning here, he's writing to believers. So it's not that they're getting saved each and every day, but they're living under, they're living in salvation. They're living as if they are saved. They're engaged in the fight. They have that confidence of their salvation. Uh, I wear a hat six days a week, probably 14 hours a day, or thereabouts. Um, I put a hat on. It's just kind of all. I've got people at work. Every once in a while, usually in the summer, in the, in the winter, it's only when I'm taking off my hoodie. Uh, I take my hat off, and if I'm taking a hoodie off my glasses, I, I've literally had other managers walk by and not realize it was me until they got past and said, oh, I don't recognize you without your hat. Okay, it's on, it's no big deal, it's a ball cap. Their helmet was not a ball cap. When it went on, you knew it was on. It, it, uh, it had a little bit of weight to it because part of its purpose was to deflect swords and spears and arrows. It had some, some heft to it. We need to live with that confidence that I am saved. And it's protected. Uh, we talked just uh, within the last week or two from Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you. What is it that protects our mind? It's that salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. It talks here about the sword, the sword of the Spirit or the Word of God. We have the inspired, preserved Word of God, and we need to use it because God's given it, given it to us to guide us on our way. We've talked about already. How do I know what is true? I know what is true by getting into the Word. What good is the Word if I don't get into it, if I don't read it, if I don't think about it? We have this. And so he gives us this armor. He gives us these qualities, these characteristics, these elements of the Christian life. But he doesn't stop with that armor because look at verse 18. Praying, always. Now I think this is, I don't want to say funny, but I find this funny. Praying always with all prayer. Well, what else am I going to pray with? But he's using different terms here to describe prayer. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. He said, we need to be talking, communing with God, not simply begging Him and asking Him for things. We need to be engaged. Um, conversation. Not the, not the King James conversation, which is my life and manner of living, but conversation like 2023, where we're talking with people. Conversation is to be dialogue, not monologue. Okay. Um, the reason most of my teaching is lecture style because I've given up trying to pull answers from people over the years. You ask a question and all you hear is crickets. Um, and so I've just changed the way I do it. But when I'm communing with God, I'm talking to him and he, through the word and the spirit, is talking to me. But he wants me to be engaged in talking to him, praying always with all prayer and supplication. He wants me to go to him in prayer. And so, be ye holy. How is that done? I've got to be willing to stand for what's right. How is that done? He's given us the tools. He's given us the armor that we need to fight a spiritual battle. We hear a lot today about militias and things like that. Okay? It's not that kind of battle. God hasn't called us to overthrow the government. God has called us to fight against the devil. That is to be job. There are so many people in the world today that get all caught up in the politics and everything else and completely ignore the priority. My calling is to live holy in this present world. My calling is to follow the example, the model of Jesus Christ. I am to model myself after him. 
Well, let's run through the application questions very, very quickly here. Uh, first of all, in light of what we see in these passages, where do we find ourselves struggling as we seek to live a whole... Living a holy life isn't easy. You know that, I know that. We struggle, we fall. Which is why John said, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father because he knows that we are going to fall, we're going to sin, we're going to do wrong. But he's there. God is there on our side to argue our case before God. I mean, I mean think about it. We, we read the passage, we have an advocate with us. Who's the advocate? Jesus Christ, who is God. He's fully engaged on our behalf. We cannot live a holy life on our own. But if we don't want to live a holy life, we're not going to live a holy life. We've got to have the desire, but understand that we can't do it on our own. Holiness is in the hope of the gospel. I have to have the desire to know the truth of the gospel if I'm going to live my life the way he wants. And we'll often fall short of holiness, but keep in mind that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. And he has offered us the forgiveness of sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to think about it once in a while. No, what does it say? If we confess our sins, if I understand what I've done wrong and I ask him for forgiveness, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And it doesn't stop there. What does the verse say? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We cannot live a holy life on our own, but we have a God who will make us clean and pure and holy. Next, let me find it. Um, what power do we have to live a life that is holy and pleasing to God? If we can't do it on our own, then how do we do this? Uh, first of all, we have the Spirit of God that dwells within. If I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, the Bible teaches me that His Spirit dwells within me. Two things. Helps me to know right from wrong. Gives me the strength to do that which is right. When we talk about Christian liberty, it's not that I can do what I want, it's that I can do what he's told me to do, and I don't have to yield myself to the work of the devil. I can stand for him. I can do what he wants. We have the word. So we have the spirit of God. We have the word of God. I like that. The believers at this time, as Peter was writing, as Paul was writing, as Matthew wrote this gospel, they didn't have the word of God. Say, so, well, they had the Old Testament. No, they did not. The temple had the Old Testament. The synagogue had some copies of. They did not. They didn't have a Bible that they could carry around. They didn't have a Bible in their house. They didn't even have fragments of a Bible in their house. But they had the Spirit. Here today, we have the Spirit, and we have an even equally good re tool, resource. We have the Word of God. So we have the Spirit. We read this. Who helps me to understand this? The Spirit of God. Not only do I have the book, he's given me the one to interpret it for me so that I can know what it says. And so we have the Word. And then we have other believers to encourage us, to exhort us, and to pray. So he's given us the Spirit of God, he's given us the Word of God, and he's given us others to help us along the way. We stumble, we fall, we ask God for forgiveness, we've got others to help us and to help us to bear the load. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1. again, for time, I'm supposed to be done in like, yeah, 30 seconds. Um, in 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul was writing to the Corinthian believers and he told them to pattern themselves after him, to follow his example. And I mentioned before, that is a rather audacious statement. And that can be a dangerous statement. Because others can set a good example, but it's Jesus Christ who has set the perfect or the ultimate example. And I need to understand that. I can say, man, I wish I could live my life the way he does. But I need to always keep in mind that my ultimate example is Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean that we can't talk to others and say, hey, could you help me because I want to do... But always understand that he is the one that we're supposed to follow. Uh, many people 
would say that they reject Christianity because of the hypocrisy. Um, there's nobody perfect, not even you and I, not other believers. There's nobody that's perfect. And we're to evaluate by Christ, not by people. Well, Christianity is so bad. Well, well you know what? It's, Christians aren't the measure. Jesus Christ is the measure. With that in mind, we always need to understand that there are other people watching. And then the last one, uh, when we're confronted by skeptics, there are those people again that they don't want to believe. They reject the Bible. Why is it important to remember that they are not the enemy? They could be your neighbor, your coworker, maybe family. They do reject the Bible. They, reject, they don't want to hear it. Keep in mind, they are not the enemy. It's a spiritual battle. We may face believers who are adversarial and confrontational, but the battle is not physical, it's spiritual. It's not the people around us. And God has told us to do what? We are to pray for our enemies. Not to fight against them, to pray for them. And so Peter admonishes them to live the holy life. Not to do, but to be. To be like Christ. Father, thank you for the day and for your goodness to us. I ask, Father, that you would take the uh, principles that we see within these passages, God, that you would apply them to our lives. Help us to have a desire to live the way you've called us, to live in a way that pleases you. I ask you to be with Pastor, give him the words to say in the service to come. Help us to have hearts and minds that are open to what you have for us. And we ask this in your name, amen. Hey, have a great day.